Hi everyone, welcome to Chalk Talk Med, where I cover high yield medicine topics for students. Uh, raise your hand if you could use a little help understanding the difference between breast feeding jaundice versus breast milk jaundice. So one, two, three, yup, that's everyone, uh, myself included when I was a student. So since this is a common confusion, here's a quick video to help you understand it well. All right, so here's a quick outline of our talk. We're going to start with an overview of neonatal jaundice because uh, these two conditions fall in that category. Um, we do have a bilirubin metabolism refresher because um, remembering the steps actually helps you understand the pathophysiology of these two conditions better. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time quickly talking about breastfeeding versus breast milk jaundice, their similarities and their key differences, and I'll share the summary table with you at the end. Let's go. All right, so first let's start talking about neonatal jaundice. Neonatal literally means newborn, and jaundice, of course, refers to the yellowing of the skin that happens due to too much bilirubin depositing in that tissue. And if this happens in the sclera, that's another place that we commonly see this. This is known as scleral icterus. The problem here is excess bilirubin. So jaundice in anyone, including neonates, the underlying problem is excess bilirubin. So neonatal jaundice is a newborn who has too much bilirubin in their body. So the next step now is to figure out what caused this. And this is a very important question to answer because it's going to help us guide our treatment. All right, so neonatal jaundice is caused by a lot of different conditions, so it's helpful to organize them. So this is one way to keep track of them. So the most common cause is physiologic. So this is known as benign neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. Um, closely associated, we have jaundice that's associated with breastfeeding, and there's two types of this, breastfeeding jaundice and breast milk jaundice. Then finally, you have the jaundice that's due to underlying diseases such as hemolysis and the rest of them that are included here. But for the rest of this video, we're going to focus on this bucket right here, jaundice that's associated with breastfeeding, and it's two types, breastfeeding jaundice and breast milk jaundice. All right, so what are breastfeeding and breast milk jaundice? So I think the easiest way to think about this is that they're just an exaggerated version of physiologic jaundice. So remember that all newborns are um, have some transient elevation in their bilirubin. That's usually mild and transient. It goes away within a couple of weeks. But in these two conditions, this can become exaggerated and lead to higher levels of their bilirubin or possibly a prolonged duration of their jaundice. And this is usually seen in breastfeeding infants. And even though these two conditions sound very similar, they have very different mechanisms. So that's what we're going to focus on in the rest of this video. All right, so before we can talk about the pathophysiology of our condition, we need to have a, a good understanding of how bilirubin metabolism works. So here's a quick refresher. So it all starts in the spleen. The splenic macrophages break down the old red blood cells. And as a byproduct of heme, we have unconjugated bilirubin. The problem with unconjugated bilirubin is that it can be toxic to the body and it doesn't serve any purpose, so we send it off over to the liver to be able to eliminate it through bile. But it is not water-soluble, so it has to be first uh, conjugated to become conjugated bilirubin, and that's done by the enzyme UGT that tags on glucuronic acid to it. So now we have conjugated bilirubin, and now this is water-soluble, so it can get inside of the liquidy environment of bile and be eliminated through the biliary tract and end up in the small intestines. And now this is great because our conjugated bilirubin can go down this pathway right here and be eliminated. So first, uh, it gets converted to urobilinogen uh, by the action of our gut bacteria, our gut flora, and then urobilinogen becomes stericobilin. Then stericobilin is eliminated through feces. And just a little fun fact, uh, the brown color of stericobilin is actually what gives feces its brown color. Okay, but back to our bilirubin. So most of the conjugated bilirubin is eliminated in this way, but a small amount of the uh, conjugated bilirubin in the intestines, actually, if it hangs out long enough, it's going to become deconjugated here by this enzyme beta-glucuronidase, which is found on the brush border. And at first glance, this name may be kind of weird and obviously hard for me to pronounce, but the name actually tells you what it does. So glucuronidase means it removes glucuronic acid. So essentially, it's going the opposite direction. So it's going from conjugated bilirubin to unconjugated bilirubin. And the unconjugated bilirubin in the small intestines does not like to stay there. So it gets reabsorbed and returned to the liver through enterohepatic circulation. And in this way, a small amount of our bilirubin gets absorbed in the form of unconjugated bilirubin and stays in the body. Okay, and finally, I just want to mention that this last part with the deconjugation of bilirubin and the enterohepatic circulation is really key in the pathophysiology of our two conditions. So as we go through them on the next slide, I just want to highlight that we're going to be really talking a lot about this part of the pathway right here. All right, so now let's talk about the differences between breastfeeding and breast milk jaundice. So let's start with breastfeeding. And with both of these, the focus should be on the second part of the word. So here, feeding. This is what's going to give you the answer. So the problem here is feeding, and specifically, the feeding is ineffective. 
there's a lot of reasons why breastfeeding can be complicated. For example, mom may not make enough milk, baby may have trouble latching, there may be an infection of the breast such as mastitis, but whatever the cause is, feeding is ineffective. So this is going to lead to decreased PO intake and therefore the baby or the, the neonate is going to be dehydrated. So why is this going to cause jaundice? So if there's less fluid intake and we have less fluid inside of the neonate, that means that there's less fluid in the GI tract. So this is going to lead to a slower elimination of bilirubin in there. And therefore, this bilirubin is going to hang out long enough to become deconjugated, enter the enterohepatic circulation, and now you're going to have the uh, bilirubin is going to be not excreted as much, and you're going to have more of the reabsorption of that unconjugated bilirubin that we talked about at that last step. So this is going to lead to elevated levels of indirect, aka unconjugated bilirubin. Now, on your test questions, one big clue, the main clue that this is breastfeeding and not breast milk jaundice, is that this infant is going to have signs of hypovolemia and dehydration because that's the main pathophysiology here. So this is going to present as infants who have inadequate weight gain or even weight loss, and you also uh, want to watch out for signs such as decreased stool and urine output because these are the main things that we really uh, monitor in neonates to find out how they're feeding and how they're getting hydrated. The management here, well, if the problem was uh, not enough fluids and nutrition, then the management here is going to be to provide fluid and nutrition support. And then the last thing is you have to monitor the bilirubins in these infants just like you would with any other neonate that has hyperbilirubinemia because if the levels of unconjugated bilirubin go high, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and cause chronicterus. So rarely if the levels are very high and if um, this jaundice is severe, then you would want to intervene with phototherapy to prevent chronicterus. All right, now in our last slide, let's see what happens in breast milk jaundice. And again, the key is in the second half of the word. So human milk, as opposed to formula, has really high levels of beta-glucuronidase. And you remember this, this is the enzyme that causes deconjugation of bilirubin in the GI tract. So this is going to lead to more unconjugated bilirubin in the GI tract, which is going to then enter the enterohepatic circulation. And just like we saw over here, we're going to have more unconjugated bilirubin being reabsorbed, and so this is going to lead to higher levels of unconjugated, aka indirect bilirubin, just like we saw over here, just for a completely different reason. So the key on the test question that's going to distinguish this is that these babies do not have any dehydration. That is not the pathophysiology here. So these babies are going to have a normal weight and normal stool and urine output. So that's how you can distinguish this from breastfeeding jaundice. And the treatment for this one is usually self-limited, and most of these inf uh, neonates can continue to breastfeed as long as the bilirubin levels are not too high. And of course, you're going to monitor the bilirubin, and if they do get high, then you would intervene with phototherapy to prevent chronicterus. All right, so before we wrap up, I do want to mention that here we talked about some complications that are associated with breastfeeding, but the takeaway from the video should not be that breastfeeding is bad. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, as you see right here, strongly recommends exclusive breastfeeding in all infants up to six months of age, and that's because breastfeeding has tremendous, tremendous benefits for both baby and mom. That's it, and that's all. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more, you can check out the related videos that I've linked here. Uh, you can also search this channel, Chalk Talk Med, for any other topics you want to learn about. And if you have ideas for a new video or you just want to give feedback on this one, please feel free to drop your thoughts in the comment section. But thank you for watching and see you next time.